please, Regina. <laughs> Thank you very much for the lovely introduction um, and thank you Adrian and Tobias for organizing this great conference uh, and thank you so much for inviting me to, to give this talk. Now for some reason I can't go forward in my slide. Let me try again. Now you see the slide? Sorry? No, we cannot. Now? No. No, you have to share your screen again. Yes, I tried that. I'll try again. Yeah. Now it's on. Now that yeah. should be working, right? Yeah, we can see that. Wonderful. The first thing that goes is happiness. You cannot gain pleasure from anything. That's famously the cardinal symptom of major depression. But soon other emotions follow happiness into oblivion. Sadness, as you'd known it, the sadness that seemed to have led you here. Your sense of humor, your belief in and capacity for love. Your mind is leached until you seem dim-witted even to yourself. If your hair has always been thin, it seems thinner. If you've always had bad skin, it gets worse. You smell sour even to yourself. You lose the ability to trust anyone, to be touched, to grieve. Eventually, you are simply absent from yourself. So this is a quote from Andrew Solomon's wonderful book, The Noonsday Demon, in which he describes, obviously, his own experiences um, of suffering from major depressive disorder. And in that book, which I highly recommend, he weaves that together with um, scientific research um, on the phenomenon. So depressive disorders generally are a very pervasive phenomenon. Uh, in 2015 uh, alone, the WHO reports 322 million worldwide suffered from depressive conditions. So according to the DSM-5, depressive disorders are characterized by, quote, the presence of sad, empty or irritable mood accompanied by somatic and cognitive changes that significantly affect the individual's capacity to function. Now in this talk, I will focus on a subgroup of depressive disorders, namely a major depressive disorder and the most prevalent symptoms um, that I will focus on in this talk um, are a loss of interest in activities that usually would be enjoyable. Uh, it's connected to social withdrawal, so to general retreat from social interaction. And it's also characterized by fatigue, a feeling of stupor um, and um, rumination uh, on multiple occasions. Um, now it should be noted um, that symptom clusters show great um, inter-individual reliability, and it seems that there are also interesting differences ac across cultures. Uh, but interestingly, in a condition called recurrent major depressive disorder, um, there's also intra-individual reliability. So, so people who suffer from that condition who experience several or multiple depressive episodes during their lifetime uh, seem to experience depression differently across those episodes. So in this talk, I will um, tackle with three questions. So the first question is how can we describe the phenomenology of major depressive disorder on a personal level? Uh, the second question will then be how these descriptions can be related to a subpersonal account um, and uh, in this case I would propose that predictive processing can uh, provide such a subpersonal level description. And then the third and final question 
um, I will explore today is why it can and should this account be established in non-representational terms. Um, so in the first part of the talk, I will focus on personal level descriptions of major depressive disorder, and I will focus here on phenomenological work by Matthew Radcliffe and Thomas Fuchs. So according to Radcliffe, major depressive disorders often associated with what he calls a sense of estrangement, a feeling of isolation, and a loss of the possibility of interpersonal connection. And what is more, uh, what also becomes obvious from um, the study he conducted in 2011 with um, a, huge, a large uh, sample um, of depressive individuals is that people not only withdraw uh, from social interactions, but that they often experience um, other people as threatening, as uh, insulting, as discouraging, um, etc. So overall self, life and world appear to be characterized by stasis, that is by a lack of the possibility of change. Right? Everything feels just unbearable um, and the feeling that there's a possibility for a positive change for the better, that's also um, absent um, during depressive episodes. Um, and this kind of absence is felt as Radcliffe um, says, um, hope, practical significance and interpersonal connections are not just gone. Their loss is very much part of the experience. It is felt, he says. And this felt absence also looms large in rumination, which I define um, following um, psychological research largely um, as a maladaptive type of inner speech that is monothematic and negatively valenced. So if you think back um, to, to the quote um, from um, the book um, by, by Andrew Solomon, it's something like, I'm stupid, I'm ugly, nobody likes me, I don't really like anyone anymore. And this would go on and on the same kind of pattern over and over again in, in, in rumination, just to illustrate that a bit. Intriguingly, in depression, what seems to happen is that your sense that you're of your own body also changes dramatically. Um, so Radcliffe um, characterizes this um, by experiences of heaviness, of extortion, and a lack of vitality. And um, as uh, Thomas Fuchs um, adds, the body is no longer experienced as something through which you can easily connect to the world around you and engage with that world. Um, rather, the lived body loses the lightness, fluidity and mobility of the medium and turns into a heavy, solid body, um, as uh, Fuchs describes it. Um, accordingly, depressive individuals experience often fatigue, a deceleration of movements, which concerns locomotion, um, but, but also speech, which I find, find really interesting. And um, there's also, again, this pervasive experience of, 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 of stupor um, that often characterizes um, depressive experiences. So if we abstract a little bit from all these different ingredients to depressive experience, we can say, also would argue that depressive experiences are characterized by a sense of loss, a loss of agency, a loss of meaningful interactions with the social environment, and um, also a loss of bodily vitality and agility. And these existential feelings of loss and impossibility, I would argue, integrate all these various aspects of phenomenological features of major depressive disorder. Now, the notion of existential feelings goes back to, to work by, by Radcliffe, uh, Radcliffe again, um, and he defines existential feelings as ways of finding oneself in the world. Um, and it's important to note that Antonio Damasio and many others have argued for a distinction between emotion and mood. So if you go along with that distinction, then an existential feeling would be some kind of mood that pre-structures what you can experience emotionally, perceptually, through your actions, 
um, and through your interactions uh, with, with other people. So these existential feelings of loss and impossibility define the possibility space, or I would say in the case of depression, the impossibility space for perceptual, active, cognitive and emotional states and processes. Now, importantly, um, existential feelings are embodied feelings. Um, as Radcliffe puts it, any existential disturbance will be associated with some sort of change in bodily experience, um, however subtle. And that will also become important in, in, in the second part of my talk. Now, the question is how can we relate this personal level phenomenological um, account of major depressive disorder to a subpersonal predictive processing account? Um, and my answer would be um, that these two accounts um, stand in an enabling relationship following uh, work by, by Susan Hurley here. So according to Hurley, subpersonal informational and causal theories explain how personal level phenomena become possible, are enabled, but need not share structure with personal level descriptions of processes as rational or conscious. So my proposal then is that a predictive processing account promises to offer an explanation of the causal enabling conditions of the personal level phenomenology of major depressive disorder. Now, what is predictive processing? As probably all of you know, um, it has received much attention in philosophy and the cognitive sciences. And I take it that in the cognitive sciences, uh, Andy Clark and Jakob Hovey have done perhaps the most visible work, but there are many, many others uh, who've, who've done uh, great research um, on that, including um, most speakers um, at this conference. So overall, PP promises to provide an integrated framework for approaches to perception, action, cognition, and affect. And I think what's really interesting about this framework is that it offers new tools for thinking about radical disturbances of lived experiences, as can be seen in work by Fletcher and Fritz, uh, Bat Cog and colleagues, and Julian Kieverstein and colleagues have also done really great work on that. Um, so, so the general idea um, of predictive processing, as I understand it, is that humans, um, human organisms, I should say, proactively generate a so-called hierarchical um, model of the statistical regularities of their own bodily states and the environmental and states in the environment that give rise to, to sensory input. So generative model controls action under conditions of uncertainty where this uncertainty arises in part from an unstable, variable, ever-changing uh, environment. And the idea is that this kind of generative modeling, um, at least in the long run, approximates Bayesian conditionalization. Now, how does it work? The general idea is that the generative model is used to predict sensory signals that can be either bodily, by which I mean extracerebral, bodily or environmental, um, and these um, signals would arise as a consequence of the organism's engagement uh, with the environment. Now, this generative model is hierarchically organized and at each layer, the predictions can be understood as estimations of the most probable bottom-up signal from the layer below, and then the divergence of the prediction and the sensory signal is the prediction error, and then the prediction error serves as the bottom-up signal to the next layer above, as you can see here um, in the figure. So basically, the overall policy is to minimize prediction error, and there are two ways of doing that. So one is perceptual inference, um, in the case of perceptual inference, what happens is that predictions are updated as a result of ensuring prediction error and an active inference and embodied actions change um, the available input in the sensory array um, 
where um, they can, this input or this sensory signal, I should say, originates either in the extracerebral body and or the local environment. Um, and these actions are supposed to bring about predicted sensory states. Now, there are two types of active inference. There's preproceptive active inference here, preproceptive predictions, um, that is predictions um, about um, your, the arrangement of your body and parts of your body in space, cause body movements uh, that change the stimulus array in the local environment. Um, so this would be action classically construed. Um, but then there's also interoceptive active inference. Um, here, interoceptive states are actively changed. Um, so interoception here um, concerns the inner physiological states of the bodies that are actively changed and thereby enabling effective experiences um, as Frist and Barrett and, and, and Seth have, have uh, convincingly argued on my view. Now there's a delicate balance between perceptual and active inference and that balance is modulated by what is called precision estimation. So the estimation of precision, that is the inverse variance, it's just a way to assess the certainty or uncertainty in prediction error signals. And the causal influence of a prediction error signal increases in proportion to its expected precision. That is, um, the more um, precise or certain a sensory signal or prediction error signal, I should say, supposed to be, the more causal weight it will be given um, in the course of the entire prediction error minimization process. Now, precision estimation is assumed to be realized by neurotransmitters, for example, serotonin, dopamine, and now adrenaline, um, but also by neuromodulatory peptides, for example, oxytocin. Um, so this evidence remains indirect for the time being, but their computer simulations um, and indirect empirical evidence that seems to, to, to support um, this assumption. Now, how can, how can these ingredients contribute to better understanding of major depressive disorder? Um, overall, I would say that disturbances in preproceptive and interoceptive active inference and aberrant um, precision estimation give rise to existential feelings uh, or enable the emergence of existential feelings. Now, in general, proprioceptive active inference is enabled by sensory attenuation, that is, by the assignment of low precision to sensory signals in the moment when a movement is executed. Right, in order to, to, to for the system to know, so to speak, um, that it's actually moving, it has to attenuate, uh, as it were, uh, incoming uh, sensory signals, and that's called sensory attenuation. Now, interestingly, there seems to be a trend also that Cogan and colleagues have argued towards suspended sensory attenuation in major depressive disorder, and the suspended sensory attenuation would then lead to a decrease of the contributions of proprioceptive active inference to prediction error minimization. So what does that mean? Proprioceptive active inference has a decreased overall causal influence um, on uh, prediction error minimization. And then in turn, the causal influence of perceptual inference increases proportionally. Now this process seems to be associated with social uh, withdrawal um, because suspended sensory attenuation is combined with a strong influence of precise prediction error that indicates adversarial social causes of sensory input. Right, so, so the idea here is that um, I don't actively engage with you as, as people in my social environment anymore, but what I do realize is that you seem to be judging me, to not appreciating me as a person to what I do. I avoid this kind of situation overall, being passive, being inactive, trying to protect myself against threat, uh, against um, any kind of 
of negative negative social feedback. Um, so I, I just uh, completely withdraw and um, and and be just by myself, which then again reinforces the whole um, depressive experience because if you don't interact with people, then other symptoms become worse, and so on and so forth. Now, in this construal um, occurrences of ruminative in a speech um, would be just another case of suspended sensory um, attenuation. So they are unexecuted speech acts, if you like. And, and this idea is in, um, inspired by, by, work of, by work by Sam Wilkinson and, and Charles Fernihoff um, recently. And so here the idea would be that speech acts um, would be associated with proprioceptive active inference, um, which requires sensory attenuation. Now, sensory attenuation is suspended. The speech act um, is not executed um, and remains on the inside, um, if you like. So overall, suspended sensory attenuation um, would be associated with a diminished sense of agency, which concerns um, your overall embodied engagement with the world, but which also concerns your ability to, to communicate uh, with others. Now, so far I've talked about proprioceptive active inference, but I think there are good reasons to assume that depressive experiences are also associated with changes to interoceptive active inference. Um, so the first reason is that interoceptive predictions are integrated with proprioceptive predictions at higher levels of the hierarchical generative model. And the second reason is that interoceptive active inference is associated with affective states um, and processes, um, as I've mentioned before. And obviously, depression is a mood disorder. Uh, therefore, depressive um, experiences uh, should be characterized by altered um, affective states and, and processes. Now, there have been recent attempts to um, accommodate um, major depressive disorder by, by talking about dysomeostasis, which is formally defined by Steve, uh, Stefan and colleagues um, as chronically enhanced interoceptive surprise, or equivalently, uh, which is more important for our purposes, um, low evidence for the brain's generative model of viscerosensory input. Now, there are a few background assumptions here that I don't want um, to, to, to introduce in, in this talk, um, but, but the key point here is that interoceptive active inference and the avoidance of um, dysomeostasis are unified by the functional policy to minimize prediction error. Now, the important bit here is that only active inference, that, that is, uh, in our case, interoceptive active inference can contribute uh, to keeping the organism in viable homeostatic um, states. And then the onset of major depression, uh, major depressive disorder and the experience of fatigue, um, as Barrett and colleagues have argued, can be explained in terms of dysfunctional interoceptive active inference um, that are supposed, that's supposed to be realized in egg granular or visceromotor regions um, as uh, Seth and uh, Friston have uh, suggested in a recent paper. But there's one piece missing still in our picture and that's a barren precision estimation. Um, so I would like to suggest that a barren precision estimation is just another contributing factor to the onset and then also to the persistence of depressive, uh, depressive symptoms. Um, it is associated with low concentrations of serotonin, dopamine, or adrenaline, and other neurotransmitters, as Barrett and colleagues have to, uh, suggested, and also with dysfunctions of subcortical structures, for example, in the amygdala and the hypothalamus, as suggested also by um, Barrett and, and her co-author and, and Badcock and colleagues. And obviously there is a lot of evidence suggesting that um, major depressive disorder and other um, depressive disorders um, 
are somehow associated with low concentrations of serotonin and no adrenaline at least. Um, the evidence, of course, is far from conclusive, but con in con far from uh, conclusive, but I think um, at the very least, it gives some indication that there might, that this kind of story might be on the right track. Now, the idea is to suggest that a barren precision estimation leads to suspended sensory, sensory attenuation um, under the assumption that sensory attenuation is managed um, or modulated, if you like, um, by precision estimates. And therefore, um, a barren precision estimation would contribute and be in part responsible for um, the decreased causal contribution uh, of proprioceptive active inference to the minimization of prediction error, as I've su uh, suggested earlier. So this brings me to the last part of this uh, predictive processing story. Um, Kieverstein, Kieverstein, Miller and Rietfeld have recently argued that precision estimates play an important role in the emergence of effective value. So there seems to be, they suggest, a systematic relationship between uh, embodied effective valence and what they call prediction error dynamics. So according to this view, um, precision estimates would be indicators of the expected rate of prediction error minimization. So positively valence effective states will emerge if prediction error is minimized at a faster rate than expected. And by contrast, negatively valence effective states will emerge if prediction error is minimized at a slower rate than expected. Now, what does that mean? In a paper that was published earlier this year, Kiverstein uh, and colleagues suggest that negative mood and major depressive disorder is associated with a pervasive overestimation of the rates of prediction error minimization, which then leads to a larger than expected prediction error over time. As a consequence of that, low precision is assigned to proprioceptive and interoceptive predictions, again, across time, um, which would then lead to an overall decrease of the contribution of active inference to prediction error minimization. Um, and again, we, we see the same kind of picture here, um, the overall causal influence of proprioceptive and interoceptive active inference decreases, um, by contrast, the contribution of perceptual um, inference uh, increases. Now, if prediction error is continuously larger than expected, and I think the temporal dimension is really important here, um, the negative mood pervades the experiences of the organism's perception of bodily and environmental sensory states. And this then again, just reinforces, as I've already said, um, the decrease of the engagement in uh, proprioceptive and interoceptive active inference. Now, to summarize um, this um, first and second part of the talk, um, I've argued that existential feelings of loss and impossibility, unable by combination and mutual reinforcement of several distortions um, of the prediction error minimization mechanism. Um, so the first point um, that I mentioned was that the negative impact of suspended sensory attenuation on proprioceptive active inference enabled social withdrawal and rumination, which then culminates in a diminished sense of agency. The second point was that dysfunctional interoceptive active inference um, that leads to dyshomeostasis enables feelings um, of fatigue um, and stupor, um, I might add. And then the last point was that a barren precision estimation enables the profoundly negative effective valence of depressive experiences and in turn enforces suspended sensory attenuation and dysfunctional interoceptive active inference. Now, what are the implications of this account for the scaling up problem um, and representation hunger? Um, and I will um, 
explore this question in the last uh, part of my talk. Now, Adrian has already introduced um, the scaling um, up problem. Um, here's just a very brief um, summary that I take as my starting point. So as Adrian says in his wonderful um, 2020 paper, um, the scaling up problem arises under the assumption um, that non-representational accounts might be able to capture what he calls basic cognitive capacities, um, but that these non-representational accounts um, cannot scale up to explain higher cognitive capacities like thought and imagery. Now, I take it that the scaling up problem only occurs if we assume that there's a principal distinction between basic phenomena, that would be perception and action in the here and now, for example, and higher or so-called higher phenomena, for example, abstract thought, remembering, imagining, um, or an example that's particularly relevant for the purposes of my talk um, in a speech. Now, according to predictive processing, basic and higher phenomena can be explained by relying on the same principles of prediction error minimization, right? So regardless of whether you talk about um, inner speech or low level uh, visual perception, for example, it's all about the minimization um, of prediction error that is modulated by precision estimates. So as far as I understand predictive processing, it employs continuity and entwinement rather than disparity of basic and higher phenomena. And for that reason, if predictive processing is on the right track, um, the scaling up problem just does not arise for uh, proponents of predictive processing. Now, what about representation hunger? Um, Looking back at um, the original problem of uh, representation hunger in Clark and uh, Turibio's paper from 1994, um, representation hungry phenomena are characterized by what they call requiring sensitivity to distal non-existent or highly abstract properties. Now, given that predictive processing also I have argued is supposed to equally apply to basic and higher phenomena. The question now is whether it is generally committed to some form of representationalism, right? I mean, if the, if the um, scaling up problem is not really, does not really target predictive processing as it stands, um, then the more general question is, is predictive processing a representational story of some sort or not? Now, Pavel Gladziewski in his uh, 2016 paper argues um, that a generative model is a structural representation of what he calls causal, the causal probabilistic structure of the environment. Um, and Kiefer and Torvi in their work um, concur. Now, according to Gladziewski, a generative model is supposed to be structurally similar to states here in the environment. Um, it is action guiding, it is detachable, and it's um, supposed to be error detectional. Now, what, what I find really interesting is that Gladziewski has little to say about the detachability of a generative model. So there are only a few admittedly speculative remarks uh, on that uh, in his uh, 2016 paper. And for that reason, I take it, um, he leaves um, representation hunger and the representation hunger problem unresolved. Now, given that interoceptive active inference is so important for understanding major depressive disorder and I suppose also other mental disorders. Um, it's interesting to note that structural representational accounts seem not to address how interoceptive states of the generative model are supposed to represent extracerebral bodily states, right? So they talk about perceptual states, active states, cognitive states, 
um, but they leave out a very important part of our mental lives, or so I would suggest. Now, given the formal details of PP, um, and um, I would like to, to direct you to um, the papers by Kirchhoff and Robertson and, and Van S and Mayen, um, a hierarchical generative model can be said to co-vary with rather than represent the extracerebral body and the local environment. And it should be noted that co-variation, of course, um, allows for, for um, different um, degrees. And Glatzievsky interestingly acknowledges that um, predictive processing does postulate a covariance between the states of the system and the states of the world. And given that we have this very well supported option of covariance on the table, um, I conclude um, that it's not necessary to assume um, that predictive processing is committed to structure representationalism or um, to any other kind of representationalism for that matter. Now, the part of um, or that symptom amongst this symptom cluster um, that's perhaps most subject to worries concerning scaling up and representation hunger is, I take it, um, rumination. So how can we try to, to, to say that rumination is not a target for people who want to say um, that rumination indeed is something that uh, a non-representational account cannot accommodate? So I suggest that inner speech depends on the general ability to engage in socioculturally shared linguistic practices. Now, one way to think about that is um, to, to go with uh, Vygotsky's suggestion, um, namely um, that inner speech originates in open, um, socially structured linguistic practices in our social environment, um, and then we um, start to internalize um, these uh, overt speech acts in the course of our ontogenetic development. And that then allows us um, first to, to develop self-directed speech uh, and then internalize again in square, square quotes um, that completely. In other words, we can only um, develop inner speech um, because we are social creatures, because we are linguistic creatures and take part and engage in uh, a multitude um, of these uh, social and cultural uh, practices um, that have to do uh, with uh, linguistic communication. Now, I would suggest that this kind of story also applies um, to rumination, which um, I understand, again, as a maladaptive, monothematic and negatively valenced uh, type of inner speech. Now, in terms of predictive processing, overt speech acts are realized by proprioceptive active inference that are tightly coupled with perceptual inference, um, right? So, so the idea is, uh, when I'm talking right now, um, I also um, sort of um, predict um, what my own uh, voice will sound like. So if that's right, then we could assume that ruminative inner speech is associated, as I've already mentioned, uh, with unexecuted proprioceptive active inference, uh, which is due to suspended sensory attenuation. And then the upshot of that is that the model generating a ruminative speech act would co-vary with environmental states if articulatory movements were actually executed which they are not in the case of ruminative inner speech. Now, where does that leave us? Um, I've suggested that predictive processing promises to capture the enabling conditions of the phenomenology of major depressive disorder. Um, and then in the last part of the talk, um, I've suggested that under predictive processing, at least, 
the scaling up problem does not arise. Given that so-called basic and so-called higher phenomena are explained by relying on the same principles of prediction error minimization. And then from here, um, I've argued that it is possible to develop a non-representational predictive processing account of major depressive disorder just by capturing the relationship between states of the generative model and extracerebral bodily and environmental states in co-variational rather than representational terms. And then finally, uh, I've tried to show that depressive rumination can be characterized as unexecuted proprioceptive active inference, which then leads to low covariance between the relevant states of the generative model and environmental states, um, which then in turn reinforces this entire feeling of being withdrawn, um, of losing um, one's sense of agency, at least to a certain degree, et cetera, et cetera. So ultimately, if the story is on the right track, then representation hunger isn't satisfied, it just disappears. Thank you very much.